Section 1 of The Catholic's Ready Answer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill. Section 1 Agnosticism. An agnostic query. Why trouble ourselves about matters, such as God's existence, of which, however important they may be, we do know nothing and can know nothing? Huxley The answer. If a man tells me he knows nothing about God, I can believe him, because he is supposed to know the state of his own mind. But if he tells me that nothing can be known about God, I wonder at the hardihood of the assertion and feel that I have the right to ask him to prove the proposition. But proving propositions is not a role familiar to agnostics as such. What is an agnostic? The definition given by the Century Dictionary is sufficiently accurate for our purpose. An agnostic is one of a class of thinkers who disclaim any knowledge of God or of the ultimate nature of things. Agnostics, generally, profess to know nothing about God. Some maintain that there is no convincing evidence of his existence. Others go so far as to aver that no such evidence is possible and that God, if there is a God, is forever unknowable. Agnosticism takes shape in individual minds according to their several habits and dispositions. One form of agnosticism assumes lightly and after little or no reflection that it is impossible to get at a knowledge of God or of man's final destiny. It is generally one of the fruits of indifferentism, which makes it a matter of small concern whether a man has any religious belief or not, so long as he does nothing to compromise his honor or his reputation. Another agnostic attitude of mind is the result of promiscuous though one-sided reading accompanied perhaps by a modicum of reflection though its real root often lies deeper and must be sought in the moral nature of the reader. But there is a higher kind of agnosticism which wears more of a scientific air. It goes the whole length of asserting that all knowledge is confined to phenomena or appearances. Observation and experiment, we are told by this class of agnostics, report to us the existence of phenomena which are, or may be, manifestations of realities lying beyond them. But of these realities nothing is known, and, according to some agnostics, nothing can be known. Hence, God and the human soul, and all the essences and principles of things, placed as they are beyond the reach of experience, cannot be objects of human knowledge. One type of agnosticism, elaborately expounded by Herbert Spencer, does not reject religion, but starves it out of existence. It acknowledges a first cause of all things, and holds that it appeals to the emotional element in man, and thus begets religion. But the nature and attributes of the first cause it regards as unknown and forever unknowable, the first cause is to us simply the first cause, and nothing more. Now, it should be plain to anyone who has a grasp of the idea of religion that the first cause, merely as such, does not appeal to the religious sentiment, and cannot inspire religious acts. True, the idea of a first cause does contain in germ the basis of all genuine religion, for the human reason can deduce from the notion of the first cause the idea of an infinite and eternal God, and of a creator and sovereign Lord, to whom praise, thanksgiving, adoration, and service are due. And these are real acts of religion, but the Spencerian agnostic will not permit us to draw any such deductions. For, according to Herbert Spencer, the power which the universe manifests to us is utterly inscrutable. Thus, the only pablum supplied religion is a knowledge of a first cause as such. What single act of religion can an agnostic of this type suggest as being rational in one who only knows that there is a first cause. Wonder and a sense of awe are indeed feelings which may well be awakened by the thought of a first cause of all things, 
But is the indulgence of a feeling of wonder or of awe a religious act? As well might we say that an atheist is paying his morning devotions when he stands wondering at the power of Niagara. Will such meager knowledge inspire an act of praise or of thanksgiving? We are not supposed to know whether the first cause is deserving of praise or of thanks, for the agnostic will not permit us to know anything about its, or his, attributes. To know, for instance, whether it, or he, is free, bountiful, or merciful. The same is true of adoration and dedication of will. The only act left would be that of exclaiming, Oh, first cause! or, Ah, first cause! Herbert Spencer had much better have left the subject of religion untouched. Our purpose just here is not to prove that God is knowable, or that he exists. That we have endeavored to do in the article entitled God's Existence. We are only making a little study of the agnostic frame of mind, and of the intellectual behavior of agnostics. One of the most notable points in agnostic ways of thinking and speaking is the downright dogmatism of the agnostic. If the attitude of agnosticism were one of simple ignorance or of doubt, or if its followers simply admitted their inability to see the force of the arguments in favor of theism, agnosticism would be less irrational. But for the most part, agnostics are nothing if dogmatic. They assert positively that the absolute is unknowable. But in doing so, they show an attitude of mind which is anything but scientific, and one that runs counter to the spirit of inquiry, which is the boast of the age. Scientists of our day, whether consistently or not, profess an open-mindedness which makes them accessible to truth, no matter in what quarter it presents itself, and which tends rather to widen than to contract the domain of possible knowledge. These remarks are particularly applicable to agnostics who devote their energies to the physical sciences, immersed in science, and for the most part narrowed in their sympathies by early education. They simply have no patience for examining the claims of any source of knowledge but the one that is familiar to them. The following extract from Huxley's Physical Basis of Life will illustrate this pseudoscientific frame of mind. Commending Hume's agnostic achievements, he remarks, So, Hume's strong and subtle intellect take up a great many problems about which we are naturally curious, and shows that they are essentially questions of lunar politics, in their essence incapable of being answered, and therefore not worth the attention of men who have work to do in the world. Why trouble ourselves about matters of which, however important they may be, we do know nothing and can know nothing? We live in a world which is full of misery and ignorance, and the plain duty of each and all of us is to make the little corner he can influence somewhat less miserable and somewhat less ignorant than it was before he entered it. Huxley was a feverishly busy man during the greater part of his life. His business was chiefly concerned in extending the bounds of physical science. His philosophical reading was one-sided, and his survey of the field of philosophical inquiry superficial, so that it ill became him to pronounce so decidedly on what could or could not be known in sciences which he had not mastered. The physical sciences are not the only legitimate occupants of the field of knowledge. Psychology and natural theology are sciences no less, nay, even more than physics, chemistry, and biology. For the latter sciences, when they have got beyond a certain number of laws which may easily be verified, deal very largely in pure hypotheses. The rational sciences, on the other hand, are concerned with ultimate truths, at which the experimental sciences must stop short. The processes of thought followed are, to say the least, as rational as those of the physical sciences. When the rational psychologist argues from the spiritual operations of man to his possession of a spiritual soul, or when the theologian argues from the order observed in the universe to the existence of a supreme intelligence by whom that order was conceived and brought into being, or when the metaphysician argues from the finite and the conditioned to the infinite and the unconditioned, he argues as rationally, to say the least, as one who would conclude from the presence of smoke the action of combustion. 
And yet the reasonings and conclusions of the rational sciences have been brushed aside by the agnostics and positivists of our day. But in many cases by men who have not hesitated to reason away the human mind itself. Hume, who set the pace for all such destructionists, regarded the mind as only a series of conscious acts. He removed the blackboard from the figures described on it, and left the figures standing in the air. When a man has reached that stage of intellectual degeneracy, he may be tempted to deny anything, even his own existence. Metaphysics and theology have unfortunately fallen into disrepute in an age that boasts so much of its positive knowledge. For both sciences are accused of building airy fabrics of thought on little or no foundation of reality. Well, there may be a species of metaphysics or of theology answering that flattering description, but we challenge the judgment that affixes any such stigma to the writings of the great scholastics. The reasonings of an Aquinas, a Scotus, or a Suarez are not to be rated as puerilities. These names may suggest a remote age and things no less remote from our interest, but the cream of the scholastic philosophy is given in the higher course of studies in every Catholic college. Had our scientific agnostics been put through the discipline involved in those studies, the world would know little of dogmatic agnosticism. As to the theology that deals with revelation, it is based on evidence as positive as any that furnishes the groundwork of the physical sciences. The historical evidences of Christianity have won the assent of countless brilliant minds in every century, the 19th and 20th centuries not excepted. Pasteur towered above all the other scientists of the 19th century, and yet he accepted the teachings of Catholic theology. We believers do not contend that our knowledge of God is perfect. We claim to possess an imperfect yet true knowledge of God. If we cannot comprehend his attributes, we can at least form some conception of them and give them their right names. The infinite transcends experience and is necessarily wrapped in mystery to the finite mind, but we can know it is a fact, incomprehensible though it is. When we say that God is infinite, we mean that he possesses all conceivable perfections, a perfectly rational proposition and one within the range of human thought. The illogicality of the agnostic mind when it makes a serious attempt at philosophizing is brought into strong relief by the writings of Herbert Spencer. Though an agnostic, he arrives at the conclusion that behind phenomena there is an unknowable something, an absolute, the unlimited, the first cause. Is it not strange that such a being is deemed unknowable when we know so much as that about him? And must we be forbidden to advance a step farther and deduce from those primal attributes other attributes which are logically contained in them? It borders on the ridiculous to see a philosopher of Herbert Spencer's reputation shrinking from concluding that the great first cause is intelligent, because, forsooth, if we attribute to it intelligence, it must be finite intelligence, as that is the only kind of intelligence of which the mind can form a conception. In dealing with an argument of that description, we can clinch the matter by means of a dilemma. The great first cause is either intelligent or non-intelligent. Is it non-intelligent? Spencer cannot say yes, for amidst all his vagaries he has a grasp of the principle that an intelligent piece of work, such as the universe, proves intelligence in the worker. Therefore, in some way, the great first cause must be intelligent. The intelligence we thus predicate of God need not be a limited intelligence, for we may take the notion of intelligence and negative all limitation and imperfection in it and apply it to God. We cannot bring home our limited understandings how any being can be infinitely intelligent, nor can we find in our experience anything analogous to it but our reasoning points to it as a fact, a mysterious fact, but a fact all the same. If we now add intelligence to the list of God's attributes, God is more known than he was before, and if we add one after another, all the attributes which a sound philosophy has deduced, we shall have built up the science of natural theology, 
and Herbert Spencer will be left wandering about in the curious labyrinth which he has been at such pains to construct. We need not shrink from all manner of philosophizing on arriving at the confines of the absolute, because although we are only scratching on the surface of things, nevertheless, by the aid of the God-given instrument we employ, we are enabled to discover at least a few solid ingots of genuine knowledge. Anglicans See Religion, A Change Of, and The Church of Christ, How to Find It. End of section one. Recording by Alex Durbin. Section two of the Catholic's Ready Answer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill. Section two. Apes and Men The Ape Theory Man bears so striking a resemblance to the ape that we are forced to conclude that he is descended from the ape. The Answer In the first place, why argue from resemblance to descent? Or, if you argue at all, why not conclude that the ape is a degenerate man? Both arguments would be unsound, but the one would be as good as the other. What interest can you have in thus degrading man by bringing him down to the level of the ape? Better argue thus. So striking is the contrast between man and ape that man could not possibly have been evolved from the ape. The contrast consists chiefly in this, that man has a soul endowed with reason and free will, which the ape has not. This is abundantly proved by the fact that man, by means of thought and reflection, advances from one invention of, or discovery to another. Whilst the ape, in common with other brute animals, follows his instincts and behaves today precisely as his ancestors did thousands of years ago, he has not learned to build houses, to cook his food, or to do anything characteristic of man in the most rudimentary degree of civilization. The ape's power of mimery is a superficial attribute which furnishes no proof or reason or thought. Even in bodily structure, the contrast is so obvious, at least to the anatomist, that no basis for the evolutionary theory can be found in that quarter. This is especially evident in the size of the brain, as also in the way in which the skull is joined to the spinal column a circumstance that determines whether the animal is to have the erect posture of a man or the stooping posture of a beast. The testimony of comparative anatomy, says Bemuller, is decidedly against the theory of man's descent from the ape. Man or Ape, page 59. Moreover, if such descent were a fact, we should find some intermediate forms between the mere ape and the fully developed man. We should have found long before today what is popularly known as the missing link. But the missing link has nowhere been discovered, either in fossil remains or in the living forms of animal life. The earth has been ransacked, but not a trace has come to light of the much sought for ape man. Occasionally, supposed discoveries have created a flutter in the scientific world, but they have invariably proved to be mares' nests. And yet, if Darwin's theory of infinitesimal variations covering enormous periods of time were correct, numerous specimens of intermediate forms should have been discovered. The distinguished scientist Virchow, who certainly cannot be accused of undue bias in the matter, bears the following testimony to the actual state of science on the subject. If we make a study of the fossil man of the quaternary period, who came nearest our historical ancestors in the course of descent, or better, of ascent, we find at every turn that he is a man like ourselves. Ten years ago, when a skull was found in a peat bog, among lake dwellings, or in some ancient cave, it was thought to furnish indications of a wild and half-developed state of human existence. Men thought they scented the atmosphere of apedom. 
but since then a gradual change has been wrought in our estimate of such remains. The old troglodytes, lake dwellers, and peat men have turned out to be a very respectable set of human beings. Their heads are of such a size that many a living man today would feel proud if he had one as large. We must candidly acknowledge that we possess no fossil types of imperfectly developed men. Nay, if we bring together all human fossils of which we have any knowledge and compare them with human beings of the present day, we can assert without any hesitation that among living men there is, proportionately, a much larger number of individuals of an inferior type than among the fossil remains thus far discovered. Whether the greatest geniuses of the quaternary age have been lucky enough to have been preserved to our day, I dare not conjecture. But I must say that no skull of ape or ape-man, which could have had a human possessor, or, as we take him to mean, could have been in any half-sense human, has ever yet been found. We cannot teach, nor can we regard as one of the results of scientific research, the doctrine that man is descended from the ape or from any other animal. The Liberty of Science, page 30F. In the Congress of Anthropologists held in Vienna in 1889, he adds the following to the words just quoted. We have sought in vain the missing links that are supposed to connect man with the ape. The primeval man, the genuine proanthropos, has not yet been found. Anthropologists cannot regard the proanthropos as a legitimate subject for discussion. They may see him in their dreams, but in their waking moments they must acknowledge him to be nowhere in sight. At Innsbruck in 1869, Scientists in their fever heat of discussion believed they could trace the evolution of the ape into the man. Today, we are unable to trace the derivation of one race of men from another. At the present hour, we can say that the fossil men discovered stands as far removed from the ape as ourselves. Each living race is distinctively human, and no race has yet been discovered which can be designated as apish or half-apish. It can be clearly shown that in the course of 5,000 years, no appreciable change of type has taken place. Dr. Bemuller sums up the results of his study of the question in the following statements, every one of which rests upon solid demonstration. On no recognized principle of classification can man be associated with the ape, for to say nothing of his gifts of understanding and speech, he stands quite alone by reason of the vastly superior development of the brain portion of his nervous system, and hence can lay claim to an independent position in the animal kingdom. Neither is his descent from the ape attested by science, for as yet no connecting link has been discovered, either in the higher walks of apedom or in the lower walks of humanity. Even the possibility of a connecting link is disproved by the tendency of apes and half-apes, in the course of their higher development in anatomical structure, to diverge more and more from the human type, and by the testimony of paleontology, the science of dealing with remains of extinct species of animals preserved in the earth. Such is the present state of scientific investigation, and its results are in harmony with the view which the human understanding lay and professional has ever entertained when not under the tyranny of theories that happens to be the fashion of the hour. Man or Ape, page 91, Munich, 1900. Dr. Zittel, an acknowledged leader in this branch of science, enumerates in his Outlines of Paleontology the most important discoveries made of human remains and makes the following comment. Such material as this throws no light upon the question of race and descent. All the human bones of determinable age that have come down to us from the European diluvium, as well as the skulls discovered in caves, are identified by their size, shape, and capacity as belonging to the Homo sapiens, man, and are fine specimens of their kind. They do not by any means fill up the gap between man and the ape. Dr. Ronk, another eminent paleontologist, speaks with evident sarcasm and in reference to certain scientific pretensions of the famous 
or perhaps better, the notorious, relics discovered in the Neanderthal. Science, after its many wanderings, is coming back to what Holy Writ has told us in words few and simple. And the Lord God formed man of the slime of the earth, and breathed into his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2, 7. And God created man to his own image. Genesis 1, 27. End of section 2. Recording by Alex Durbin. Section 3 of The Catholic's Ready Answer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill. Section 3. Bible Heroes. Objection. The heroes of the Old Testament are represented as being special favorites of the Almighty. On the other hand, they seem to have had many vices. What, then, are we to think of the Bible as a teacher of morality, or as a divinely inspired book? The answer. The patriarchs and some of the other leaders of the Jewish people are indeed represented as favorites of the Almighty on account of their great personal virtues. They may have had their failings as well, but their lives were written not so much on account of their personal qualities as with a view to exhibiting the special providence that presided over the destinies of their race. As fathers and leaders of the chosen people, they were objects of God's special care. But that did not exempt them from the failings to which all flesh is heir. Needless to say that their faults, great or small, have met with scant justice at the hands of the skeptical and the critical. The faults of Bible characters, such as they were, show by their very presence in the narrative that the sacred writers had no thought of giving a roseate hue to their descriptions of the deeds of their countrymen, and that their single aim was to give a trustworthy report of facts. This is indeed the unique distinction enjoyed by the Bible among the historical records of ancient peoples. Even unworthy deeds associated with great names are faithfully registered. Unlike other such records, the books of the Bible were not composed as a tribute of adulation to reigning dynasties or to serve as a flattering unction to national vanity. The writers penned an exact and impartial account of God's dealings with men and of men's behavior toward God. There is no similar record in existence. None like it ever could have arisen out of the bosom of paganism. The real and genuine shortcomings of Bible heroes we cannot, of course, either palliate or deny. The Bible itself condemns them. But at the same time, we must refuse to accept judgment of sworn enemies of the Bible when they are pleased to ascribe faults, even crimes, to the great personalities of the Bible where there is no evidence of guilt. Because Abraham, for instance, made his wife Sarah pass for his sister when both were in danger of falling into the hands of the king of Egypt, we cannot agree with the critics when they set him down as an instigator of lying. His accusers ignore the fact that in Abraham's language the word sister had a larger signification than in our modern tongues, and the fact that, after all, Sarah was Abraham's half-sister, and hence might be called simply his sister. In the same censorious spirit, the critics characterize David as a captain of bandits and a usurper of the throne. They have lost the key to the interpretation of the facts. The very first and last fact in Jewish history is forgotten, namely, that the Jewish form of government was a theocracy. God himself was in a very special sense the ruler of the nation. In his hands were the making and unmaking of its kings, if Saul was rejected and David made to reign in his stead, it was done by divine appointment, and David was consequently no usurper. If David, before ascending the throne, acted on his own responsibility and took the field against the enemies of his people, who were inflicting serious harm upon them, he did nothing inconsistent with just warfare. Neither this nor anything which he did in self-defense constituted him a bandit. In the heyday of prosperity, David did indeed commit a twofold sin, 
of a most grievous nature. But the description of this event and of its consequences, whilst showing on the one hand the rigor of God's justice, presents on the other a most remarkable example of repentance in an offender, a repentance that charmed the heart of God himself. The Lord deigned to call him a man after his own heart, and to show him, and his descendants for his sake, the mercy of a father. Surely this touching example of mercy so characteristic, if we may use the expression, of God's dealing with men, ought to move the reader of the sacred narrative to adoration and love rather than arm him against the object of God's clemency. The defender of the Bible is not bound to find an excuse for every act of the patriarchs that seems in any way dubious. In some cases, those acts may have been in a greater or lesser degree sinful. This is probably true in the case of Jacob, when he personated his brother Esau and fraudulently obtained his father's blessing. True, he may have known from his mother, who certainly knew it by revelation, Genesis 25:23, that in the designs of providence he was to take precedence of his brother. But would that excuse the deception practiced on his father? And yet, if he sinned, it does not follow that he sinned grievously, or that he should have ceased to be an object of God's special providence as a propagator of the Jewish race. The instances we have given of unfair criticism are samples of the superficial judgments passed upon the behavior of the patriarchs and upon the spirit and character of the historical books of the Bible. End of section 3 Recording by Alex Durbin Section 4 of The Catholic's Ready Answer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill Section 4 Bible Interpretations Protestant Position the Bible teaches all necessary truth to all who approach the study of it in the right spirit. In the scriptures, God speaks to the human soul, and no interpreter of his words is needed but the soul itself, enlightened by the Holy Spirit. Catholic Position The above, if we mistake not, is a fair statement of the Protestant view of private interpretation. It differs essentially from the Catholic principle, according to which private interpretation is controlled by the authority of a divinely established church. But now a question. What are the grounds of the Protestant position? As the Bible is the Protestant's final rule of faith, he should be able to quote chapter and verse for this as well as for any other article of his faith. Where in the whole compass of the sacred writings is there passage enunciating the principle of private and independent interpretation? There are passages in abundance setting forth the benefits resulting from a reading of the Word of God, but none which declare that the individual reader is independent of all control of his interpretation of it. In opposing such independence, we do not mean to imply that the Bible is simply an unintelligible book. Quite the contrary. Many parts of Scripture are plain narratives of matters of fact, and the more obvious sense of the text is the true one, or at least one true one but other parts of the Bible are abound in mysteries, or in other obscurities of one kind or another. This was doubtless the case even in the original version of the several books. But what shall we say of the modern translations, the imperfect medium through which all but a few readers get a glimpse of the revealed truth? Now, is it likely that every chance reader, however good his disposition, possesses a key to the scriptures, and sees his way through all their obscurity of thought and expression? Is it not to be feared that the assumption of such power of interpretation will have injurious, and in some cases even disastrous, effects upon the reader? St. Peter the Apostle, speaking of the epistles of St. Paul, says of them that they contain certain things hard to be understood which the unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, to their own destruction. 2 Peter 3.16 If this declaration made by no less an authority than St. Peter, and to the very people to whom the epistles of St. Paul were addressed, was justified at the time, is it not to be feared that now, after twenty centuries, the same causes are producing even worse effects?
the Apostle here mentions two effects which he traces to three causes. The two effects are, one, the resting, that is to say, the twisting or distorting of the meaning of Scripture. Two, the spiritual self-destruction of the reader. The causes are, one, the intrinsic difficulties of the text, two, ignorance, three, instability, unsteadfastness, as it reads in the Revised Version. The same three causes are in operation today, and doubtless tend in varying degrees to produce the same effects. The text with its intrinsic difficulties remains. Ignorance remains, for the three R's are the highest reach of knowledge for millions, and what special insight into Scripture is furnished by the three R's? But have not some gone much farther than the three R's? Surely, they have learned their chemistry, or their physics, or their mathematics. But none of these sciences furnish a key to the obscurities of St. Paul. But have we no theologians or exegetes? Certainly we have. And they have helped us not a little to understand the sacred volume. But if we may believe Dr. Littledale, it was just from this class that most of the ancient heresies took their rise, and all the theology in the world cannot, of itself, secure a man from that instability of which St. Paul speaks. That is to say, from that intellectual and moral giddiness which often accompanies the greatest learning. But our opponents will tell us at least let a man approach the reading of the scripture in a prayerful spirit, and he may expect to receive interior illumination. Doubtless, a prayerful reading of Scripture has produced much insight into the meaning of the sacred text. But let us not mistake the issue in the present discussion. We do not deny the possibility of personal illumination. God, from the beginning, has deigned to speak to the individual soul. But, and this is the most important thing we have to say in the present article, there is nothing more illusory than the impression of having been enlightened from on high, and in the whole course of religious history, nothing has proved more pernicious than the seeing in supposed illumination a practical rule of faith or of conduct. Where God does really enlighten, no one can enlighten it so well. But it is one thing to be enlightened, another to think one is enlightened. Many of our Catholic saints have received what they have described as marvelous illumination, but none were more distrustful of such illumination than the very recipients of it. And yet, just the contrary has been the case with those leaders of men, from Luther to Mrs. Eddy, who have confidently proclaimed a special illumination in their interpretation of Scripture. And when we see the number of such claimants to inspiration and compare their clashing creeds, all based on the same word of God, and listen to the war of words in which each denounces all the others, we begin to see the utter hollowness of the theory of private interpretation. Religious chaos was never intended to be the result of the preaching of the Christian revelation, and yet chaos is the necessary result of Christian preaching when it is based on private interpretation. But worse than chaos are the ultimate logical consequences of the theory, for amidst the chaos at least some fragments of the truth remain. But even these are destined to disappear under the powerful solvent of independent judgment, the principle of private judgment is today working itself out most consistently in the land of its origin. In Germany, individual judgment, even amongst the ministers of religion, who are supposed to have committed themselves to a fixed creed, is rapidly dissolving the fabric of Christianity itself. Personal illumination is, therefore, in no absolute sense a safe guide. In one's meditation on scripture, one may, of course, feel that reflection throws some light upon words or sentences heretofore obscure. Many sound conclusions may be drawn. Spiritual insight may increase. But still, considering that there are many things in scripture hard to be understood, and that so many readers of scripture have been mistaken in their interpretations, it is only rational that one should submit to guidance, if a guide can be found and that a guide has been provided by a kind providence cannot be a matter of doubt when one reflects on the unspeakable wisdom displayed in all God's works and, on the other hand, on the sad consequences which are seen to follow the rejection of authority in so important a matter as the interpretation of the word of God. Evidently, then, 
there is an infallible interpreter appointed by God himself, and that infallible interpreter can be no other than the Church of Christ, which St. Paul tells us is the pillar and ground of truth. 1 Timothy 3.15The Bible is for many reasons deserving of veneration, but it is quite out of harmony with modern thought. The science, the aspirations, and the general point of view of the modern world are at the opposite pole from the contents of the Bible. The answer. Language like this is held by persons in our day who fancy that all men of enlightenment have ranged themselves with science on one side against the Bible and its adherents on the other. Is it not the unique distinction of the Bible that it has compelled the attention of the enlightened since the beginning of Christianity? From the first great convert of St. Paul's at Athens to that group of brilliant minds ending with St. Augustine, which adorned the early centuries of the Church, and thence onward to the great lights of the modern world, we find the great minds of the world's history humbly accepting the Bible as the revealed Word of God, and as their guide, conjointly with the Church, to eternal life. From the way our critics talk, one would think that at least all men of science had discarded the Bible, and yet when the facts are inquired into, it is found that the great leaders of science— the men without whom science would be whole centuries behind its present stage of development, have been sincere Christians and believers in the Bible, when we find a Bacon, a Copernicus, a Newton, a Leibniz, or, to come down to our own generation, a Calvin, a Pasteur, clinging to the Bible, though standing themselves on the very pinnacle of science, we have good reason for thinking that science and the Bible are not such irreconcilable foes after all. See Science and Faith, page 413. The ranks of unbelievers have indeed swollen in our day, but the radical cause of this phenomenon does not lie in any shortcomings of the Bible. The cause is usually of a personal nature. It is natural that some should have a personal interest in wishing that the Bible were not authentic. For if the contents of the Bible are true, a personal service of God and a restraint of the passions are imperative. Thus the wish is father to the thought. And the habit of mind thus engendered is fostered by a neglect of the duties of religion. Faith is a grace, and a grace is forfeited by a failure to correspond to it. A personal shrinking from the scorn of unbelievers, and no class is more intolerant than they, accounts for the multitude of a large number who talk about modern thought, or who have other such sibyleths constantly on their lips. This being the case, we are compelled to discount considerably the face value of the testimony which is supposed to be rendered against the Bible by big numbers. After doing so, we shall probably find a comparatively small number of persons who, from one cause or another, a lack of Christian training, it may be, or the fact that they have never seen a complete exposition of Christian evidences, profess, if not opposition to the Bible, at least an inability to accept it as the depository of divine revelation. Now, it is more than likely that some who belong to this class have really never read the Bible, or that they have read only parts of it here and there, or that they have read it under the guidance of one of those microscopic experts of the higher criticism, who are skilled in examining single words and phrases, but who are unable to see the wood from the trees. To any sincere mind thus circumstanced, we must beg leave to make the following suggestions. Read the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, from beginning to end. You will notice that you are reading not one book but many books, a whole literature, in fact, whose one subject is God and his dealings with the human race. Begun several thousand years ago, it has received additions at intervals, according as God has deigned to reveal himself to his chosen people. Now, notwithstanding the multiplicity of its parts and the length of the time it took to compose them, you will discover, on the one hand, a remarkable unity, and on the other, a remarkable growth of ideas. You will see the light of truth increasing from the dawn to the perfect day. You will see evidence of prophecy fulfilled. Finally, you will see salvation brought to the Gentiles, and the light of truth diffused throughout the world by the coming of him who is the way, the truth, and the life. One of the fruits, it may be hoped, of so comprehensive a view of the subject will be an answer supplied to a very important question, to wit, how account for its sublime conception of the deity, and for the purity and holiness of its public worship amidst the idolatries and impurities of all the surrounding nations? How for its monuments, its customs, its laws? How shall we account for the very preservation of a race of so unique a character, and one that never rose to empire for well nigh two thousand years amidst circumstances constantly tending to its destruction? Given the Jewish race, we look for its complement in a literature that shall interpret it as a fact in the world's history. And if such a literature be forthcoming, who will be surprised to find it abounding in the marvelous? And yet a mere reading of the Bible will not suffice. 
The Bible cannot be read in any and every frame of mind. To read it in a fault-finding temper would be fatal to an understanding of its meaning and spirit. Yet we are not counseling that it be read with a wish to believe or a strained effort to get into sympathy with its contents. We might in that case seem to be advising a species of auto-suggestion, against which our very knowing generation is so much on its guard. All that we ask is that you bring to the reading of the Bible as much open-mindedness as you would bring to the reading of any other body of literature, sacred or profane. We ask you not to believe, but to regard as conceivable, not only that there is an infinite and eternal God, or that he is able to reveal his mind and will to those whom he has created, but also that he might on occasions manifest his presence and his power by extraordinary events. The evidence that there is such a God, and that he has so manifested himself to mankind, will develop itself in your mind as you proceed through the volume. We feel confident that no skeptic can read the sacred writings from beginning to end in the unbiased temper we have been describing without feeling his whole attitude of mind undergoing a change. This will especially be the case when he arrives at the narrative of the Savior's life as given in the Gospels, a life which, when viewed in both its own wonderful details and in its relation to types and prophecies, indeed to the whole of Jewish history, proves that there has been a veritable opening of the heavens, and that God has, in a most remarkable and touching way, revealed himself to mankind in the earthly career of his eternal and only begotten Son. But perhaps you are under the spell of the scientific hubbub, which has tended of late years to trouble some Christian minds. You have perhaps heard the note of triumph sounded by anti-Christian scientists, and sounded still louder by many of their unscientific followers. But a slight review of the results of scientific research will probably convince you that in this scientific jubilation there has been much noise but little wool. The experimental sciences, to begin with, have been invoked against the supernatural element in holy writ, especially against miraculous interference with what are called nature's laws. Miracles are impossible, we are told, because they are an interference with the constancy and uniformity of natural laws. Now, in the first place, it must be remembered that we stand in no need of modern science to be informed that nature behaves in certain uniform ways, e.g. that fire burns and that water quenches fire. Common observation has told us much since the days of Adam. Science has but extended and methodized common observation. Nature's uniformity is no more certain today than it was thousands of years ago. But apart from that matter, neither science nor common observation can go a step further than to declare that it is of the nature of water, or of fire, or of any other natural agent to behave in a certain way, and that they have, as a matter of fact, so behaved. But to declare that under no circumstances can they behave otherwise is quite beyond their province. There is no warrant in science, therefore, for saying there can be no interference with nature's laws. Ordinary experience proves that such interference is possible. A stone, in obedience to the law of gravitation, falls earthward, but its fall may be arrested by a human hand. Why cannot God, the author of nature, arrest its fall as well? Science would not be disproved by interference in either case. Science can only tell us what things do in accordance with their natures, not what they will do as a matter of fact. The miracles of the Bible are therefore not proved impossible by science. Ah, but there is evolution in my way, you will remind me. How can I ever get beyond that? Why is evolution such an obstacle in your way? If you could once step out of your anti-Christian environment, evolution would appear in a somewhat new light. You would find that among sincere Christians, even among Catholics, there are those who are convinced that within certain limits there has been an evolution of species among animals and plants. Opinions favoring a limited evolution of species may be traced back as far as certain of the fathers, the great Christian authorities of the early centuries, notably St. Augustine of the 5th century. You probably mean by evolution just one type of evolutionary theory, the pure Darwinian, which held sway for a few decades, but which, as professional scientists well know, has since been shoved more than halfway off its throne. Indeed, the fortunes of pure Darwinism furnish a striking illustration of what the cooler heads among Catholic theologians have been predicting for many a day. Let scientific theorizing run its course, they have told us, and if it be opposed to Christian truth, it will eventually show a suicidal tendency. Among leading evolutionists, natural selection is no longer in the ascendant. It was always a thorn in Darwin's side that certain devout Darwinians would not follow their leader the whole length of the theory on natural selection. Even the joint author and propounder with Darwin of the theory of natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace, steadily held to the spiritual nature and divine origin of the human soul, and after more than a half-century's study of the subject, he published a work, The World of Life, in which more emphatically than ever he averred that phenomena which he described and of which he had made a very special study proved the existence of a creative power, a directive mind, an ultimate purpose, which is no other than the development of man, a being who is intended to interpret the rest of nature and deduce from its phenomena the existence of a supreme and overruling mind as their necessary cause. Here is evolution, after its long excursion in the wilds, meeting Christianity at the crossroads and hailing it as a friend. 
There seems to be nothing inconsistent with Christian teaching and holding that the present countless species of animals and plants have evolved from a smaller number of primitive species. And even though any such evolution of species would have required immensely long periods of time to elapse before the appearance of man on the earth, there can be little or no difficulty in granting their existence. For although the whole material universe was made in six days, as the Bible narrates, there is no certain indication in the Bible of the length of each of the six days. For all we know to the contrary, it may have been an exceedingly long period. In pursuance of the evolutionary idea as applied to man, the most strenuous endeavors have been made to discover the missing link, that is to say, any fossil remains of an extinct species intermediate between man and the ape. As such connecting species would, in Darwin's view, be exceedingly numerous, it is a wonder that we have not been stumbling against them in every morning's walk in the country. As it is, an occasional reputed discovery has created a sensation for a brief period, but eventually has been shelved, once and for all, as a scientific myth. As to the more extreme types of evolutionary theory, the Hegelian, for instance, which is an extension of Darwin's ideas to the whole range of being, we shall have to refer you to the articles entitled specifically Evolution and Haeckel, remarking, however, that you will search in vain in the books of Haeckel and his compeers for anything that even pretends to be a demonstration of any single proposition that is distinctive of their system. As regards the objections so frequently urged in the name of astronomical science, we shall have a word to say about them in the article entitled Bible and Science. No less futile are the objections based on historical and archaeological science and on the higher criticism. The attacks made upon Christianity from this quarter are probably more persistent and relentless than any others. And yet, what has been accomplished by our assailants? What fact or what principle has been evolved which contradicts any essential or quasi-essential Christian idea? For not every idea that has gained currency among Christians can be regarded as an essential part of Christian doctrine. Propositions that have been defined by competent authority, and those all but certain or morally certain facts or truths which have been generally held as such by Christians, as, for instance, the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, these are matters about which we should feel concerned, even if prima facie evidence against them, or anything resembling it, were supplied by honest criticism, but such is not the case. The false anti-Christian hypotheses so freely adopted by the higher critics have actually retarded the progress of true criticism. Here, as everywhere else, hunting on the wrong trail has been a sheer loss of time. It is refreshing to hear a leading specialist in matters archaeological, such as Professor Sace of Oxford, taking to task the more extravagant of the higher critics. The arrogancy of tone, he remarks, adopted at times by the higher criticism, has been productive of nothing but mischief. It has aroused distrust even of its most certain results, it has betrayed the critic into a dogmatism as unwarrantable as it is unscientific. Baseless assumptions have been placed on a level with ascertained facts, hasty conclusions have been put forward as principles of science, and we have been called upon to accept the prepossessions and fancies of the individual critic as the revelation of a new gospel. The Higher Criticism and the Verdict of the Monuments, page 5. Not infrequently, while the higher critic is weaving his fabric of mixed fact and hypothesis, the spade of the explorer among the ruins of some ancient city turns up an object bearing an inscription which obliges the critic to undo his work to the last thread. Speaking of the effect of archaeological discovery on the conclusions of the higher criticism, the author quoted above remarks, The assumptions and preconceptions with which the higher criticism started, and upon which so many of its conclusions are built, have been swept away either wholly or in part, and in place of the skepticism it engendered, there is now a danger lest the oriental archaeologist should adopt too excessive a credulity. The revelations of the past which have been made to him of late years have inclined him to believe that there is nothing impossible in history any more than there is in science, and that he is called upon to believe rather than doubt. So that there are two sides to the picture, one of which you had hardly supposed to be in existence. We have been dealing almost exclusively with modern science because it is chiefly science, or what is taken for science, that is flaunted so contemptuously in the face of religion. As to the aspirations of the modern world, these are likely to prove its bane. The inflated human spirit aspires to being the self-sufficing lord of the earth and the supreme arbiter of human destiny, with no need of God or of heaven, or of grace or of salvation. But this is not the first time that the aspirations of created beings have soared too high. I will ascend above the height of the clouds, I will be like the Most High, was the aspiration of Lucifer. We shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, was the aspiration of our first parents. And who can doubt that the same nemesis will overtake the third and last class of aspirants as overtook the first and the second? The proud aspirations of the human spirit will ever have been the worst obstacle both to the happiness and to the truest progress of the race. And why so? Because, and here we shall be using language familiar to modern thought, such aspirations are supremely unscientific. How so? 
simply by not recognizing that the true basis of all rational aspiration lies in a fact, and that fact is that we are created beings, and consequently must submit to be taught and ruled by the Creator. No wonder that your general point of view is not the same as that of the writers of the Holy Writ. End of section 5. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 6 of The Catholic's Ready Answer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M.P. Hill. Section 6. Bible Myths. Objection. The Bible contains many stories that remind us forcibly of the myths of early pagan history. How can we be expected to believe the story of the serpent tempting Eve, that of the flood with its fabulous quantity of water, that of No collecting the countless species of animals, and then is not God frequently represented in a strangely human way, when, for instance, he is described as taking slime and forming it into a human body, or as shaping Adam's rib into a woman, or when he is said to be moved to wrath, or to repent of his creation of man? The answer. In reading many of the interesting and remarkable things narrated in the book of Genesis, we must not be surprised if the events connected with the foundation of a universe and of a human society are not of the commonplace type that make up our daily history. Supposing a creation and a revelation, what wonder if the hand of God should in some sense be visible in his creation? What wonder if a mingling of the human and the divine should be a matter of frequent occurrence? An impartial and broad-minded examination of the Bible stories in question will show that, so far from being a counterpart of pagan mythology, they stand out in bold relief from the whole mass of ancient legendary lore and exhibit a dignity and sobriety of content which is conspicuously wanting in the fabulous history of pagan origins. To pass in review all the alleged mythical stories of the Bible would be to write a commentary far outrunning the limits of these brief articles. We shall have to content ourselves with a specimen or two. From these the reader will get an idea of the light in which we read the Bible. The Serpent Tempting Eve An evident fable, says the sceptic, and he dismisses the subject with a shrug of his shoulder. Nevertheless, it is not so evidently a fable. Animals do not speak, but beings of the purely spiritual order, such as the angels, may use the animal nature or material substance of any kind for their purposes. But perhaps our objector is a materialist and does not believe in spiritual natures. The angels are to him only another mythical feature of the Bible narrative. To prove the existence of spiritual beings does not fall within the scope of the present article, but whilst referring our sceptical friend to other parts of this work, we cannot refrain from asking him why he denies the existence of spiritual beings. Is it not to be feared that his opposition to the spiritual is resolvable into a mere feeling or impression based upon a crude, unreasoned notion that anything imperceptible to the senses anything that has not three dimensions, has no reality whatever, is simply nothing. But we must assume here the existence of spirits and show how, on this assumption, the narrative we are considering acquires a dignity and a degree of credibility which remove it far from the absurd or the fabulous. The evil one made use of the serpent as an instrument of temptation. But why make use of an animal of any kind, because an animal, and especially the serpent, was the best suited to his purpose. Consider the circumstances. The devil, who is a spiritual being, plans the ruin of man, who is partly of a spiritual, partly of a corporeal nature. The devil seldom tempts by direct suggestion, but usually through our natural concupiscence. But in the state of primitive innocence, concupiscence, by God's special favour, was absent. There was nothing in man's nature in sympathy with moral evil. Hence, the only available instrument within the devil's reach was the purely animal nature with which man has so much in common. 
he chose the serpent, at that time gracious of form and known to be more subtle, wise, than any of the beasts of the earth. We may add that he selected as the direct object of his temptation the woman rather than the man, as the weaker of the two. Eve was doubtless surprised to find the serpent, wise though he was, using human speech, but she knew there were superior beings in the universe who might speak through the serpent, and if she was aware that she stood in the presence of such a being, the fact easily explains the deference she showed the serpent's judgment during the temptation. A sensible appetite was then under the control of reason and gave no handle to temptation. The devil assailed her through reason itself. He plied her with the why and the wherefore of God's commands. Why hath God commanded you that you should not eat of every tree of paradise? God doth know that in what day soever you shall eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Pride was awakened as it had been among the angels. Eve, the joint ruler with Adam of God's creation, was already high in the scale of being, but now she would rise higher, she would be a goddess, she would know how to distinguish good from evil, and thus be the arbitress of her own destiny. It was only now that sensible appetite was awakened, and the woman saw that the tree was good to eat, and fair to the eyes, and delightful to behold. She plucked the fruit, ate of it, and afterward used the devil's arguments to induce her partner to do the same, adding, no doubt, an appeal to his affection. Such is the story of man's fall from grace, a story whose details are so true to nature, so intrinsically probable, and withal so replete with dignity. And yet it is a story that has been brushed aside as a piece of absurd fiction. The Flood No less vigorously has the biblical account of the flood been assailed, and yet, as regards the fact, as distinguished from the circumstances, the Bible account has been confirmed by the traditions of so many ancient peoples that even the most sceptical must admit its truth. This is one of the many instances in which an independent study of antiquity has corroborated the sacred text. The historicity of the biblical flood account is confirmed by the tradition existing in all places as to the occurrence of a similar catastrophe. F. von Schwartz enumerates 63 such flood stories which are, in his opinion, independent of the biblical account. R. André discusses 88 different flood stories and considers 62 of them as independent of the Chaldee and Hebrew tradition. Moreover, these stories extend through all the races of the earth, excepting the African. These are accepted, not because it is certain that they do not possess any flood traditions, but because their traditions have not as yet been sufficiently investigated. Le Normand pronounces the flood story as the most universal tradition in the history of primitive man, and Franz de Litch was of opinion that we might as well consider the history of Alexander the Great a myth as to call the flood tradition a fable. It would indeed be a greater miracle than that of the deluge itself if the various and different conditions surrounding the several nations of the earth had produced among them a tradition substantially identical. Opposite courses would have produced the same effect. A. J. Mass, S. J. In the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 4, page 407. So much for the fact an extraordinary event which impressed itself deeply upon the memory of mankind really took place, and the history of it the Bible professes to give in its details. It is these details that are principally attacked by the higher critics. It goes without saying that it is the supernatural element of the history that bears the brunt of the attack. The flood story savours too much of the miraculous to be acceptable to the atheistic critic. The gathering together of the countless species of animals and the housing of them in the ark, the feeding and tending of so vast a herd by eight persons, the submerging of immense continents to the height of the loftiest mountains, and the consequent emptying of half the seas, 
the preservation of fresh water and salt water fish in a mixture of brine and rainwater, which must have been fatal to both kinds. These and other circumstances are rejected by the higher critics as fabulous, because apparently miraculous. Whether there is any need of invoking the miraculous, strictly so called, to explain the facts as narrated may be a question. God could have given no special assistance, short of the miraculous, to enable him to perform the task assigned him, and by a purely natural catastrophe, though on an extraordinary scale, could have accomplished without miracle the destruction of the human race. But still, if it be shown that any one of the disputed circumstances calls for a miracle, we of course shall not be staggered by the prospect of admitting one. We believe in the possibility of miracles, and would naturally look for them in a universal deluge. In a destruction of an entire race, we should expect an assertion of God's power and majesty of the most impressive kind. And yet we must add that even the most devout believer in miracles will place a limit to his acceptance of miracle stories in the concrete. Miracles are not to be multiplied without necessity, i.e. necessity of interpretation, is a sound adaptation of a medieval formula. Working under the guidance of this principle, many of the most orthodox Christian scholars have endeavoured with some success to reduce the limits of the miraculous in the case of the flood. One question on which many others are thought to hinge is whether the deluge covered the entire globe or only a part of it. In the first place, it is well to remember that among the ancients the common conception of the earth was not that of a globe but rather of a more or less flat surface with a mysterious substructure of one kind or other and with watery bounds whose extent was no less mysterious. Its vastness was not even dreamed of. No expression in their literatures ever conveyed the idea of a globe 25,000 miles in circumference and covered by oceans and continents of enormous extent. But great or small, the earth was seldom spoken of as a whole except by philosophers and astronomers. Words in ancient writings, which we frequently render by the earth or the world, meant at the most the inhabited part of the earth, which in Noah's time could have been a small fraction of the whole. Frequently they meant only that part which was most familiar to the writer and his countrymen. It is conceivable, therefore, and even probable, that when any such expression as the earth or even the whole earth is found in the history of the flood, its meaning is to be similarly restricted. It has been noted, moreover, that the Hebrew expression which has been translated, the earth, may easily be rendered the land, the region. If this rendering be adopted, the interpretation of the deluge history will be comparatively easy. Views in favour of a restriction of the geographical area of the deluge have been held by many orthodox writers, and amongst them a large number of Catholics. We, for our part, should welcome any successful attempt at demonstrating that the deluge was geographically not universal. Any such demonstration would obviate the necessity of our believing that God flooded the entire globe in order to destroy a race inhabiting only a small part of it, and expressions denoting universality might be regarded as only relatively universal, that is to say, as relating to a particular region, and thus the defender of Revelation would have a freer hand in dealing with its adversaries. Another question has been mooted, which can hardly be a question for Christians who hearken to the voice of authority and tradition, namely, whether the deluge was universal as regarded the human race. Were all men destroyed, or were only those destroyed who inhabited a certain limited area to which alone the Bible history refers? The biblical account, considered in itself and apart from authority and tradition, may possibly admit of an interpretation limiting the destruction of men to a part only of the entire race, but indirectly, that is to say, through the interpretation given it by the fathers of the Church, it forbids any such view. No Christian, therefore, who respects the authority of those great teachers of the early church can safely permit himself to hold that any part of the human race was saved from the deluge except Noah and his family who had taken refuge in the ark. 
It has been objected that the history of the race furnishes evidences that not all men are descended from No's family, and that consequently some must be descended from a part of the race unaffected by the flood. The supposed evidence lies in such facts as the following. Nations which certainly have sprung from No found in the places in which they first settled inhabitants who had occupied those places for a considerable time. Egyptian monuments of very remote antiquity exhibit the Negro just as we find him today. Even at that early period, he was completely differentiated from the Caucasian. Languages, too, have developed in a way that must have required a greater time than has elapsed since the flood. The gist of all such arguments is that more time is needed to explain the development of races and languages than is allowed by any version of the Bible. This objection has been urged with some persistency, and yet it is based on a false assumption. We do not pretend to have established a fixed and certain system of biblical chronology, so that if it can be demonstrated from undeniable facts that the development of races and languages required a longer time than is usually assigned, there is nothing in Christian hermeneutics forbidding the concession of a longer interval between the flood and the present day. Such, if we mistake not, is the general attitude of Catholic scholars toward history and science in their bearings on biblical questions. Obscurity and mystery hover over many parts of the sacred writings, but where a clear and decided meaning is not otherwise discernible, the well-balanced Catholic student avails himself of the services of history or of science whenever either can offer an interpretation at once well based and well defended. Our position then is briefly this. We are ready, if need be, to accept even as miracles the wonderful events by which God visited his wrath upon a sinful race. It is rational and, in some sense, natural to suppose that at the close of one great act of the drama of human existence, and one that was marked by an all but universal catastrophe, the power of the Almighty should have been more than ordinarily manifest. But at the same time, we are aware that Christian and even Catholic scholarship points to an interpretation of the text which reduces the miraculous element to comparatively small dimensions. Only that part of the earth may have been submerged upon which human beings were living, God's primary purpose being to destroy the human race. On this hypothesis, such expressions as all flesh, all things wherein there is the breath of life, need not be taken in a strictly universal sense, they are neither more nor less universal than the expressions which have been rendered by the earth, which may have meant in reality only that region of the earth inhabited by men. Whilst holding, then, that all human beings were destroyed by the deluge, we need not hold that the entire globe was submerged, and whilst holding that all living things within reach of the flood were destroyed, we can still believe that many species of animals, not including men, however, were not touched by the flood. If this be the case, No's task of collecting specimens of each species may have been a comparatively easy one. As to the anthropomorphism of the Bible, or its representation of God as acting in a human way, we know, on the one hand, from the Bible itself, that God is purely spiritual, and that He is infinite and unchangeable. And if, on the other hand, he is represented as acting in ways inconsistent with these attributes. It is only because he wishes to accommodate himself to our human limitations. He knoweth our frame and adapts his way to ours. He is described as being moved to anger or as being pleased with the sweet odour of a sacrifice or as repenting of having created man. The deep impression produced upon men's minds by such modes of representing the deity, enables us to understand something of God's motive in permitting himself to be so described. As regards apparitions of God, vouchsafed to his servants, although it was forbidden in the Old Testament to represent him by any graven image, nevertheless he himself deigned to give man a sense of being brought nearer to his God by sensible forms which impressed upon men's minds the awful feeling that they were face to face with their Maker. 
When God is represented as fashioning earth into a human body, it need not be supposed that an actual moulding of the clay by an apparently human hand might have been witnessed. At any rate, it is plain from the scriptures that when God produces anything, he does so by a simple act of his will, and that his willing of anything is from all eternity. Neither change nor motion is in him, but only in things without. End of section 6. Recording by Florence. Section 7 of The Catholic's Ready Answer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill Section 7 The Bible and the People An Accusation it is notoriously the settled policy of Rome to withhold the Bible from the people. Witness the number of decrees on the subject in the history of the papacy. Versions of the Bible in the language of the people have been an object of the Church's special aversion. The Answer As a general proposition, it is untrue that the Church withholds or desires to withhold the Bible from the people. The Church has at times passed restrictions not precisely on Bible reading, but on the reading of certain versions of the Bible, and even then only when such restrictions were necessary as preventatives of serious harm. The Bible is indeed a sacred thing, but the most sacred of things may be abused, and who will deny that the Bible has been abused in the hands of the unworthy? The prevention of such abuse is so rational that the opposition of Protestants to it would be quite unintelligible if we were not aware of the effect of early education in scaling up the minds against all access of new ideas that seem to conflict with early impressions. Dare be open-minded, on the subject of the Bible, is the friendly admonition we would give to our Protestant readers. Now, in detail, what are the real facts of the case? The first fact takes the shape of a letter. It may be found among the introductory pages of the modern reprints of the Douai or Douai Bible, which is in every good Catholic household. It is written by Pius VI to Archbishop Martini of Florence in reference to the latter's translation of the Bible into Italian. The following is the text of the English translation of the part of the letter that particularly concerns us. Beloved Son, Health and Apostolic Benediction At a time that a vast number of bad books which most grossly attack the Catholic religion are circulated even among the unlearned to the great destruction of souls, you judge exceedingly well that the faithful should be excited to be reading the Holy Scriptures, for these are the most abundant sources which ought to be left open to every one to draw from them purity of morals and of doctrine, to eradicate the errors which are widely disseminated in these corrupt times. This you have seasonably effected, as you declare, by publishing the sacred writings in the language of your country suitable to every one's capacity, especially when you show and set forth that you have added explanatory notes which, being extracted from the Holy Fathers, preclude every possible danger of abuse. Dated April 1, 1778. Close quote. Here we see the precious treasury of God's Word placed within the reach of all who have a knowledge of the language in which the version is printed, whilst at the same time precautions are taken against any abuse of it. The Word of God is given in its entirety, but its interpretation is safeguarded by extracts from the Fathers, that is to say, from the great authorities of early Christian ages. The version of the Bible praised by the pontiff is in the Italian language, but that was not by any means the first time that the sacred writings appeared in a modern tongue. Our second fact is that in nearly every modern language there have been numerous translations of the entire Bible, 
As these versions were either positively approved or appeared with the knowledge of the authorities, it is altogether impossible that the subtle policy of the Church can have been to withhold the Bible from the people. To anyone who knows the facts or even a fraction of them, the accusation must seem to be a calumny. Germany, the birthplace of the Reformation, is conspicuous for the number of editions of the whole Bible in the language of the people produced in Catholic times. Bibles in German were among the very first products of the printing press. The art of printing, we may remark in passing, is an invention of Catholic days, and printing presses were at work more than half a century before Luther's revolt in 1517, sending forth to the world copies of the Bible in Luther's own language. Between 1466 and 1518, there appeared as many as fourteen editions of the complete Bible in High German and five in Low German. This is a fact which no historian of today will deny, though it is probably never mentioned within the walls of a non-Catholic Sunday school. In the light of this fact, Luther's dramatic story about the joy and delight he felt in discovering, at the age of twenty, a complete Bible, of which he had hitherto seen only fragments in the homilies, must seem quite astonishing. If the story is true, it is significant, not as pointing to the rarity of Catholic Bibles, but as throwing a light of its own upon the character of Luther's education. The truth is that in the schools which Luther attended as a boy, the ancient classics were the absorbing and almost exclusive subject of study. This according to his own testimony, whereas in the more conservative schools and in those which the traditional methods of the church were followed, the Bible was part of the regular curriculum. We have said nothing, though much might be said, about the numerous German versions of the whole or of parts of the Bible issued in manuscript before the invention of printing. It was the work of a lifetime to produce, and it required a little fortune to purchase a manuscript of the entire Bible before the printing era had dawned. Still, the laborious work of producing was carried forward in the monasteries, and the demand on the part of those who were able to purchase was large enough to occasion the production of an immense number of copies of the scripture, some of which are still extant. It is needless to say anything of the numerous editions of the Bible in Germany which have appeared in recent centuries. The Alioli edition, with its clear and copious exposition of the text, would alone be sufficient to disprove the assertion that versions of the Bible in the language of the people are the Church's special aversion. In the Italian language, eleven printed editions of the whole Bible appeared before the end of the fifteenth century. Much the same story might be told about Spain and France. In England, the people had the open Bible from the earliest centuries. Anglo-Saxon versions of Scripture are well known to scholars. Fragments of them are extant and may be read in modern reprints. When, in the course of time, the old language became unintelligible, the Bible was rendered into the more modern tongue. Even Kramer admits as much. When, he remarks, the Saxton language waxed old and out of common usage, because folk should not lack the fruit of reading the scripture, was again translated into the newer language, whereof yet also many copies remain and be daily found. Blessed Thomas More, whose word carries as much weight with non-Catholics as with Catholics, tells us, Myself has seen and can show you Bibles fair and old, which have been known and seen by the bishop of the diocese and left in layman's hands and women's to such as he knew for good and Catholic folk that used it with soberness and devotion. Even so stout a champion of Protestantism as John Fox cannot refrain from adding his voice to the general chorus of testimony. If histories be well examined, he assures us, we shall find both before the conquest and after, as well before John Wycliffe was born and since, the whole body of the scriptures by sundry men translated into this our country tongue. 
Strange, you will say, that such thorough-paced anti-Romanists as Fox and Kramer should have let the cat out of the bag as they would seem to have done in the above passages. But the truth probably is that, whilst they knew it would serve their immediate purpose to make the true statements we have quoted, they never suspected the controversial use to which their words would be put in a later age. Since 1582 English-speaking countries have had the New Testament and, since 1609, the Old Testament translated into modern English idiom. The Douai or Douai Bible is a familiar object in Catholic households. In a word, the open Bible is a well-attested fact as regards the Catholics of the world, in our case, is made out. Not so, says a voice somewhere in the audience. There may have been an English Catholic Bible, but it must have had few readers, as there was a positive ban put upon the reading of the scriptures in the English tongue. But this is our answer. Never, either in England or elsewhere, has the Church banned a Bible because it was in the language of the people. But it has forbidden the reading of certain versions of the Bible, which perverted the meaning of Holy Writ. Could the Church of God have done less? Granted a Church with authority, and what is a Church without authority? Was she to permit the Scriptures to appear with a falsified text? Whatever action the Church has ever taken with regard to English Bibles, it was entirely of a piece with its legislation from the beginning, whose object was to preserve from pollution the stream of divine revelation. To this legislation all Christian churches are indebted for their possession of a Christian Bible of any kind. But let us glance at the facts of the case. The reader will hardly need to be informed that in the fourteenth century a priest named John Wycliffe was cited to appear before the ecclesiastical authorities to answer the charge of heresy. Wycliffe had been styled the morning star of the Reformation, in accordance with the Protestant fashion of claiming kinship with all those who have had difficulties with their ecclesiastical superiors regarding matters of faith. But anti-Romanism, like misery, acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. Wycliffe was indeed in many respects the morning star of the Reformation, but there is no orthodox Protestant of the present day who would not be shocked by certain of his views which are not even Christian. He died in apparent communion with the Church, but he had fairly launched what was known after his death as the Lollard Heresy. The Lollards were fanatical revolutionists, equally dangerous to the Church and to society. It was against the Lollard perversions of Scripture that the Church directed her anathemas. In 1408 a convocation held at Oxford forbade any unauthorized person to translate the scriptures, and who will say that such provisions are not within the right of a church, tracing its descent to the apostles, the greatest of whom, St. Peter, 2 Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, warns solemnly against wresting the scriptures from their true meaning, whether by mistranslation or by any other process. The convocation forbade, in the second place, anyone to read without approbation any version of Scripture made either during or after Wycliffe's lifetime. And Wycliffe had died twenty-four years before. As Blessed Thomas More remarks, We hope, dear reader, you see in this law nothing unreasonable, since it neither forbids good translations to be read that were already made of old before Wycliffe's time, nor condemns his because it was new, but because it was naught, that is, bad, perverse. How, then, it may be asked, after so wide a diffusion of the scriptures in the vernacular languages, could the notion ever have arisen that the church would fain keep the Bible from the people? We shall have to let our readers puzzle over it. But our opponents have one more shaft in their quiver. It must be conceded that Catholics are anything but a Bible-reading body. Bibles are multiplied, but Bible-readers are not. In answer to this reproach, 
We would remark, in the first place, that in this matter it is easy to exaggerate the contrast between Catholics and Protestants. There is a vast deal more reading of Scripture among Catholics than is suspected outside the Church. Priests, to begin with, are obliged daily to recite an office in which there is always a portion of the sacred text from the New or the Old Testament. Many priests have devoted their lives to a study of the sacred writings. Beside the priests there are hundreds of thousands following the way of the councils, and these have scarcely any counterpart in Protestantism, to wit the members of the religious orders, who meditate daily on the life of our blessed Saviour as narrated in the Gospels. The public reading of Scripture is also a common practice in houses of religious. For the faithful at large, passages from the Gospels and Epistles are selected to be read from the pulpit. Children are taught their Bible history, which is sometimes worded from the text of the Bible itself. In some of our Sunday schools the older pupils receive special instruction in the Bible. Anyone who knows the run of Catholic publications must be acquainted with a number of small annotated editions of the Gospels which are issued to meet the demands for Bible knowledge among Catholics. A good deal of this will be a surprise to our non-Catholic friends, but this is only a sample of what they have yet to learn about their Catholic neighbors. And besides all this, it is a fact of no small importance that whilst the reading of the Bible has undoubtedly been on the increase among Catholics, it has very notably decreased among other Christian denominations. But significant as these facts certainly are as showing how much the Scriptures have been held in reverence by Catholics, we confess we do not by any means stake our case, nor should we, even if the facts were double or treble their present volume, on the amount of Bible reading which may be placed to the credit of Catholics. If the Bible readers were even fewer than they are, we should not be a bit concerned if we could feel any assurance that they were growing in appreciation of what is to them of much more importance than even Bible reading. If, for instance, they were daily learning to appreciate more and more the need and the efficacy of divine grace, especially as received through the sacraments, if they were conceiving daily a greater sorrow and detestation for sin, which they know is a condition for receiving pardon in the sacrament of penance, if in greater number and with growing fervor they were dedicating their lives to the service of their neighbor for the sake of him who regards what is done to the least of his brethren as done to himself, and all these are known to be distinctive Catholic traits, then we should be reconciled to their comparative neglect of Scripture reading. After all, it is the general point of view of the two religions respectively that makes the greater part of the difference between Catholics and Protestants in this matter. Given a religion that takes its stand solely on the Bible, there is at once an antecedent likelihood that a sort of omnipresence of the Bible will be a distinguishing feature of that religion. But, given a religion which holds that Christ established a living authority, whose teachings are by a special providence preserved from error, in whose custody the sacred writings are placed, and from whose first commissioned teachers a considerable part of those writings have emanated, we mean, of course, those forming the New Testament, at once the Bible ceases to be the be-all and end-all of a man's religion. It takes its place beside another great oracle of divine wisdom in which is heard the living voice of apostolic authority. Before drawing this article to a close, we would add that there is another important reason why the Bible, at least the whole Bible, is not so universally or indiscriminately read by Catholics. There are passages in the Old Testament which should never be placed under the eyes of the young or the frivolous in whose case a morbid curiosity might easily turn the sacred text into an instrument of harm. The use to which the Bible has frequently been put by both of the classes mentioned is only too well known. And now, finally, we would ask our Protestant friends, what do they fancy could have been the Church's motive for its supposed policy of depriving the people of the Word of God? We have seen that, as a matter of fact, she did not deprive them of that treasure, 
as the Bible has been rendered into all the vernacular tongues in every age of the Church's history. But had she adopted a different policy, what could she have feared or hoped for by so doing? Were the contents of Scripture a secret of which none but a few possessed a knowledge? Or were they a secret on which depended her power or influence or the personal advantage of her rulers? The very notion of such secrecy is too absurd to be entertained for a moment. The Bible was as open as could be in all the languages known to scholars, or clerks as they were called in those days, among the laity and the clergy. And yet the clerks were the very class that could trouble the peace of the church most. They were the reading and thinking class, and independence of judgment would naturally assert itself in their ranks more than elsewhere. As for a reading public in anything like the modern sense, it simply did not exist. And yet, as we have seen, even for the comparative few who could read, or had leisure to read, the church provided the scriptures in the common tongue. In giving the scriptures to all classes, the church was not unmindful of the admonition of the apostle, that the sacred writings contain many things difficult to be understood, and things which the unlearned and the unstable wrested to their own destruction. For, inculcating as she did obedience to the church, as the divinely appointed interpreter of the scriptures, she reduced the danger of a reckless and independent interpretation to the minimum. The non-Catholic reader of the Bible has no such safeguard, and hence Catholics might justly charge the Protestant churches with placing the Bible in the hands of the unlearned and the unstable without furnishing any safeguard against the vagaries of human interpretation. End of Section 7 The Bible and the People Section 8 of The Catholic's Ready Answer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill Section 8 The Bible and Science Objections According to the Bible, the world was made in six days, whereas geology proves that enormous periods of time were required to bring the earth to its present condition. The earth, which astronomy has shown to be only a satellite of the sun, is represented by the Bible as having been created before the sun, and the heavenly bodies generally are described as though they were lamps hung in the heavens to light the earth. The Answer The objection represents the state of mind of very many who get their ideas on these and kindred subjects from popular lecture courses and seldom or never consult a reliable authority. Serious-minded men, distinguished in the world of science, have pondered the first chapters of Genesis and have not come to the conclusion that the Bible and geology are at variance. Nay, not a few of them have seen a substantial agreement between the mosaic order of creation and the sequence of events discovered by the geologist. Some have even marvelled at the points of identity between the testimony of the book and the testimony of the rocks. In what sense was the world made in six days? Were the days of the same duration as ours? The word used in the original Hebrew, yom, means day. But as the Hebrews had no word to express epoch, era and the like, the word yom might be used for that purpose. That the word was rather elastic in usage is proved by the very passages under discussion. In one place it means daytime as distinguished from nighttime, one five, and elsewhere in the same verse, darkness and the succeeding light as constituting one day, whilst in two, four and five, it means the entire period of creative activity. There is no difficulty, then, in taking the expression to mean a period or epoch, but if it can be taken in that sense, the objection falls to the ground, because believers in the Bible need not take it as meaning a day of twenty-four hours' duration. As a matter of fact, the term has been taken in the sense of an epoch by a respectable body of Catholic exegetists and theologians. 
Their interpretation is based, first, on the indefinite character of the word, second, on the facts narrated in the account of the work of the first three days, and finally, on the principle that the Christian interpreter of Scripture may, in the case of obscure passages, invoke the aid of the natural sciences no less than that of philology and general history. During the first three days of creation, the alternation of day and night was not caused by the rising and setting of the sun, because it was not till the fourth day that the sun was made to shed its light upon the earth. Hence, those three days were not determined as to length, as our days are, but by the apparent revolution of the sun. They were determined as days by the recurrence of light after darkness, but there is no reason compelling us to believe that their length was the equivalent of our twenty-four hours. There is much reason for thinking they were long periods of time. Certainly the events of the first three days were so stupendous in the aggregate that if they were dependent on the operation of natural laws, they would necessarily require the lapse of long periods of time. And in the bringing about of such events, as, for instance, the emergence of continents from the deep, Is it not more probable that God left such changes to the work of natural laws created by himself than that he intervened by a direct exercise of his power? This is enough for our purpose. The narrative of the sacred writer has its mysteries, but it cannot be proved to contain any falsity. As to the account of the origin of the heavenly bodies, which the objector holds up as a sample of the mythical in the Bible, we have this to say. There are always two ways of telling a story. Moses has his way of telling of the origin of sun, moon and stars, and science has a way of its own, though it must be said that in this particular case, science tells its story in faltering accents, as not being at all sure of its authenticity. Moses tells us distinctly that God made two great lights, the one to rule the day, the other to rule the night, as also the stars, and that, he set them in the firmament of heaven to shine upon the earth. Now, here God is represented either as having created the heavenly bodies there and then, or as having made them, after they were created, luminaries in respect to the earth, i.e., by making their light reach the earth. In neither case does the narrative fall under the ban of astronomical science. Supposing that the heavenly bodies were at that moment created, and therefore were created after the earth. Does astronomy say anything to the contrary? It is able, doubtless, to tell us something of the earth in its present relations to the sun and the moon, but has it yet demonstrated in what precise order sun, earth and moon came into being? The nebular hypothesis, according to which the earth emanated from the sun when both were in a gaseous state, is, after all, only a hypothesis. But there is no absolute necessity of supposing that when God is said to have made two great lights, he is represented as there and then creating two heavenly bodies. He may have already created sun and moon, but now made them into lights in respect to the earth, i.e., made their radiance for the first time reach the earth, possibly by the removal of the dense mists that may have covered the earth. It must be remembered that although the Earth is physically an insignificant part of the universe and a satellite of a greater body, it may nevertheless be the moral centre of the whole and the part that dominated all others in the designs of the Creator. The rest of creation may well have been planned and ordered with a view to its ministering to the planet that was to be the habitat of man and the scene of God's great mercies to the humankind. As Moses apparently wrote from this point of view, his narrative calls for an interpreter who realises this circumstance, but whose mind is nonetheless open to the teachings of science on the subject. Science, however, has nothing to say that is certain and reliable. We have said that many scientists have found substantial agreement between the biblical account of creation and the geological record. Among others, our distinguished American geologist, Professor Dana, following the lead of the French scientist Guyot, has exhibited in detail some most striking points of agreement in the two records. Having first drawn up a table showing the stages of progress in the history of the globe, 
he compares it with a tabulated analysis of the work of the six days and finds that the order of events in the scripture cosmogony corresponds essentially with the order assigned them by physical science. He remarks furthermore that the scripture narrative, if true, is of divine origin. For no human mind was witness of the events, and no such mind in the early age of the world, unless gifted with superhuman intelligence, could have contrived such a scheme, and none could have reached the depths of philosophy exhibited in the whole plan. But the superior wisdom displayed by the biblical account of creation is of a piece with the superior knowledge, the clearness of detail and the sobriety and saneness of the entire book of Genesis as compared with the primitive traditions of the Gentiles, whose early legends are characterized by the opposite qualities, especially by a grotesqueness which is almost the earmark of early legendary law. End of section 8 Reading by Florence Section 9 of The Catholic's Ready Answer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill Section 9 The Bible and Tradition Protestant View The Bible alone is the Christian's rule of faith. Catholic Teaching The Bible, though it is the Word of God, is not the Christian's sole rule of faith. Ultimate guidance in matters of faith must be sought in the authority of a divinely established church, which, according to the Apostle of the Gentiles, is the pillar and ground of truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 The Bible and the traditional teachings of the church, or tradition, may indeed be regarded as the twofold basis of the Christian religion, but the church, which is the interpreter of divine revelation, and to which the promise was given that the paraclete, the spirit of truth, would abide with it for ever, John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, furnishes by its teachings the ultimate criterion of a Christian's faith. With any of our separated brethren who may happen to light upon these pages, we must plead, here as elsewhere, for a little open-mindedness. We must remind them that there has been a tradition of opinion among Protestants on certain subjects, miracles, for instance, private judgment, the Bible, which even the cleverest Protestant minds have found it difficult, nay impossible, to place upon a basis either of fact or of principle. Ask any Protestant why he thinks, as most Protestants do, that miracles ceased with the deaths of the Apostles. He has no answer. Ask him to prove that the Bible is the only rule of faith. He is equally helpless. Can he prove it from the Bible itself? Surely not. There is no statement, explicit or implied, to that effect in the pages of Holy Writ. And yet the Bible is his final criterion of truth. Does it not seem as though the Protestant accepted this principle without inquiring into its validity, or without asking himself whether, after all, it is anything more than a Protestant tradition, dating from the stormy period when those who revolted against the authority of the Church were forced to do so under cover of the Bible? Moreover, there are Protestant prejudices against certain Catholic ideas which have the effect of shutting out all inquiry into their meaning. Catholic tradition, as conceived by the Protestant mind, hardly rises above the level of the loose, haphazard sort of tradition that weighs so little with a serious historian. Tradition of that description is not of the kind to which Catholics appeal. Tradition as conceived by the Catholic is a divinely guarded continuity of teaching, raised above the accidents of time by reason of the ever-living teaching authority of the Church, which in virtue of the divine promises can never fail in its mission. The fact of such continuity of teaching we have sufficiently discounted upon in other parts of this volume. Our present task is to show by proofs, more or less direct, that the Bible cannot be the sole and self-sufficing rule of faith. A few facts bearing on the origin of one part of the Bible will make this abundantly clear. The Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible, is a familiar Protestant formula. 
Now, one considerable part of the Bible is the New Testament. Whence came the books of the New Testament? Did they not emanate from the apostles and their immediate disciples? If so, they were brought into being by the Church, of course, under God's direction and inspiration. They were an expression of the Church's mind. Their only guarantee of authority was derived from their connection with the Church. When the Holy Ghost wished to make use of human instruments for the committing to writing of certain facts and truths belonging to the new revelation, he chose them from among the accredited teachers of the Church. It was because those writers were so accredited that their writings were accepted as oracles of revelation. The whole of the New Testament is, therefore, the immediate production of the Church. Though inspired by God, its inspiration is vouched for through the Church. So far, then, from being independent of the Church, the writings of the New Testament are no less dependent on the Church than any other epistle or book is dependent on its writer. Dependent first for its existence, and afterwards for its interpretation. No part of the New Testament can, therefore, be a rule of faith except in so far as the Church guarantees its interpretation. Now, this being the case, and considering the vital connection between the Old and the New Testament, the same power of interpretation must extend to both parts of Holy Writ. The New Testament contains the fulfilment of the types and prophecies of the Old. The meaning of the Old is more precisely determined by the meaning of the New. Interpreting the one implies the power to interpret the other. The Church, therefore, which is the immediate author, and consequently interpreter, of the New Testament, must be equally the interpreter of the Old. Nor could it be otherwise in the case of a Church which was constituted the pillar and ground of truth, a Church which once heard the promise, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you all truth. The appointed guardian of all revealed truth, the Church, must find it within her competence to decide what is and what is not revealed truth, and in what sense it is revealed truth, be it written or unwritten. Hence, every part of the written record of divine revelation must be subject to her interpretation. The Bible, as an inspired volume, proceeds only from God. As a depository of a rule of faith, it must be interpreted by the Church. Therefore, taken by itself, it is not the sole and self-sufficing rule of faith. Besides the Bible, and, in the sense just explained, superior to the Bible, is the living and abiding authority of a divinely established Church. And this brings us to tradition, which, in its active sense, is nothing else than the continuous and uninterrupted exercise of the teaching authority in successive ages. Tradition, as thus described, differs exceedingly from ordinary forms of tradition, which furnish so small a guarantee of historic truth. In the first place, it is preserved from error by a special providence. The promises given by Christ to his church have been fulfilled, and the paraclete has, in very truth, abided with her. John chapter 14 verse 16 In the second place, every human means has been employed to preserve the tradition inviolate. No doctrinal decree is issued without a safe anchorage in the past, and each age bears witness to the faith of the age preceding it. Finally, the continuity of the episcopate, especially as preserved by communion with the See of Peter, has kept intact the identity of the tradition, just as the continuous life of the soul preserves the unity and identity of the human body. The necessity of such tradition and authority is obvious when we consider that the New Testament, though all true, does not contain all the truth. Things were revealed by God, or lawfully established by the Church, of which the Scriptures make no mention, one notable example being the transfer of the Sabbath from the last to the first day of the week. Where is the Scripture warrant for this, or for other changes, to which even the Protestant Leibniz calls attention, as, for instance, the permission of blood and things strangled, the canon of the sacred books, the abrogation of immersion and baptism, and the impediments of matrimony, some of which, adds Leibniz, 
Protestants themselves securely follow solely on the authority of the Church, which they despise in other things. And why should the Scriptures be supposed to contain the whole of Revelation? Is not this also a Protestant assumption, accepted blindly and never inquired into? Does the Bible itself tell us that it contains all that Christ taught? Surely not. And yet the Bible is the Protestant's rule of faith. More than this, it is antecedently improbable that the Bible contains the whole of Christian doctrine. If it did, the New Testament would be the part of the Bible in which the doctrine would be found in its entirety. And yet the circumstances of the origin of the New Testament forbid us to think that it either was or was intended to be the sole depository of all that Christ came to teach. Consider for a moment how the books of the New Testament came into existence. The apostles, to begin with, taught by word of mouth. This was their normal way of spreading the gospel. Nevertheless, they found it useful in the course of time to compose, or have others compose, brief histories of our Lord's life on earth. These have survived in the books of the four evangelists. Occasionally, after the faith had been preached in any city, Ephesus, for instance, Corinth, Rome, and the apostle who had preached it had taken his departure, he would address an epistle to his spiritual children of that place. It might be to confirm them in the faith, or to correct an abuse. And after the faith had spread to the ends of the earth, Luke, a physician, a disciple of St. Paul, wrote the first history of the church, the Acts of the Apostles. And when John had had his wonderful vision, he told the faithful all he had seen in his Book of the Revelation, or the Apocalypse. At a later period, all these writings were collected into a single volume. The New Testament, then, is composed of documents written as occasion required, or according as it seemed opportune. Such was the origin even of the four Gospels, which were written at different times by different persons, each with its own individual character and relating incidents not related in the others, each, possibly, written for a special object, for certainly St. John's Gospel was written for the special purpose of demonstrating the divinity of Christ. Now, in all this, is there any suggestion of completeness? Is it not likely that some teachings of the Apostles would not find a place in any such mass of occasional documents? The occasion not requiring it, the doctrine would not be committed to writing. Where is there any proof? or suggestion, or intimation, that a number of fragments, appearing at different times, would, if put together, form a complete and independent exhibit of Christian truth, and such as would make it quite unnecessary to have recourse to the teaching of the Church, such indeed as would reduce the Church to a position of utter subordination in respect to the books of the New Testament. God could indeed have intended that the fragments, when put together, should form a mosaic in which nothing was wanting to complete the picture of Christian revelation. But the question at issue is not whether he could have so intended, but whether he did. The burden of proof lies with those who assert that he did. The Protestant mind is so deeply imbued with the idea of a book containing all that is necessary to be known, a book in which all must read and out of which all must get what meaning they can, and, on the other hand, it has lost so completely the notion of a church divinely empowered to interpret the sacred books, that writers like ourselves might well despair of success in pleading the cause of plain logic and common sense, did we not know that at least by the grace of God, if not solely by human persuasion, Many have been led to see the fundamental error of the Protestant position. A no less forcible argument than the preceding one lies in the fact that the very genuineness of the books composing the Bible needs to be vouched for by the authority of the Church, and therefore by tradition. The writings composing the New Testament are not the only writings of apostolic times which were in circulation among Christians or which laid some claim to authorization, There were other Gospels besides the four, 
as, for instance, the Gospel of the Hebrews and the Gospel of St. Matthias. They were numerous enough to be counted by the dozen. These are known today as the Apocryphal Gospels. Whatever amount of truth they contain, they have been, from the earliest centuries, excluded from the list of inspired writings. But by whom, or by what, were they so excluded? By the only authority competent to deal with them, that of the Church. It was the Church that fixed what is called the Canon of Scripture, that is to say, which separated the inspired books from the uninspired. It is the constant maintenance of the true Canon of Scripture, and this is tradition, that has handed down to the present generation the pure and unadulterated Word of God. Consequently, if our Protestant friends possess today a Bible which is in any degree genuine, they owe it to Catholic tradition. The need of authority and tradition in determining the rule of faith and worship is forcibly illustrated by the arbitrary way in which Protestants from the beginning have appealed to the Old Testament in matters of the first moment. Every Christian knows that a vast change was inaugurated by the coming and teaching of Christ. Old ordinances were abrogated and new ones introduced. The details of this great change were announced either by our Lord himself or by his church, enjoying plenitude of power. That such high authorization was needed was the conviction of all Christendom before the advent of Protestantism. Where scripture was silent or not sufficiently explicit on the subject of the great changes, it was understood that either the word of Christ or the word of the church was alone decisive. What, then, are we to think of the conduct of sectarians appearing at a late age in the history of the Church and presuming to settle on the basis of the Old Testament questions which had been settled centuries before? As when Luther, for instance, to justify his official authorization of Philip of Hesse's taking of a second wife during the lifetime of the first, enunciated the principle that what could be done under the law of Moses could be done under the law of Christ? What are we to think of the inconsistency and consequently of the arbitrary and independent conduct of sectarians in our age who, in the case of marriage impediments, choose to follow the Church in some matters where Scripture is silent, thus acknowledging the Church's authority, whilst in others they appeal to the law of Deuteronomy? Has God left the determining of these matters to the caprice of individuals? The ultimate rule of faith is, therefore, not the Bible, but the authority of the Church. The Bible is the Word of God, but it needs to be interpreted by the traditional teaching of the Church. End of section 9。section 10 of The Catholics Ready Answer。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholics Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill Section 10 The Blessed Virgin Objections To a non-Catholic, devotion to the Virgin Mary seems to be given a very undue prominence in Catholic worship. Witness the feasts of Mary, and the frequent devotions to Mary. Besides, there is little or nothing to distinguish this homage from a real worship of one of God's creatures. The answer. The Catholic Church, as seen from the outside, does, perhaps very naturally, present to non-Catholics what seem to be objectionable features, such as the one complained of above, but not always after careful and honest inquiry. The Catholic religion, to borrow a comparison from Cardinal Wiseman, which we have used elsewhere, sometimes produces on outside observers the effect which a stained glass window produces on a passer-by on the street in the daytime. The forms represented on the window are distorted, and the picture is unintelligible, and in the same manner the forms and proportions of things within the Catholic Church produce a false impression on those who see things from without. Within the fold of the Church the impression is altogether different, as innumerable converts can testify. The truth is that devotion to Mary, however prominent in the services of the Church, 
plays an essentially subordinate part in the entire system of Catholic devotion. And what is more to the purpose, it is an essentially different thing from the worship paid to God. God, as being the supreme Lord of the universe, is adored. Mary is only venerated, not adored or worshipped, as the mother of the Son of God made man. Mary is prayed to, but only as the most powerful intercessor before the throne of God. Between the worship of God and the veneration of Mary, there is a gulf as wide as the one between God and his creatures, between the infinite and the finite. And yet, God himself has deigned to associate Mary so intimately with himself in the work of the redemption that no Christian can realise what is told us in the Gospels without giving a prominence in his thoughts to the human instrument employed by the Almighty for the accomplishment of his designs. Think of the essential dignity of the mother of the incarnate word. Think of the praises lavished upon her by the inspired voices of angels and men. Hail, full of grace, or, if you will, Hail, thou who art so highly favoured. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. These are the words of the angel Gabriel, who added, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. And therefore also the Holy One that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Luke chapter 1 verses 28 to 35. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the infant leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Luke chapter 1 verses 41 to 43. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, because he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Luke chapter 1 verses 46 to 48. Such is the greatness of Mary, as reflected in the narrative of the inspired writer. When angels and saints unite in sounding the praises of Mary, the Church of God cannot be silent. The recognition of her dignity and of her personal merits was one of the most prominent features of the devotion of the early Church. The Roman catacombs, in which the first Christians took refuge from the violence of their persecutors, exhibit even today unmistakable evidence of early devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Visitors to the catacombs may see her represented on the walls of those underground chambers just as she is represented in Catholic churches of our time, and that these pictures illustrate a devotion that was universal among the Christians of the first centuries is attested by the extant writings of the period. Open the works of the Fathers and testimonies multiply as you turn the pages. The writings of St. Irenaeus, St. Gregory Nazianzen, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Ephraim Cyrus, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, St. Peter Chrysologus, St. Proclus, St. Basil of Seleucia, contain passages relating to Mary that are worded like any typical passages that may be taken from Catholic writings of our own day. Through her, says St. Proclus, all women are blessed. Eve is healed. Mary is venerated as becomes the mother, the handmaid, the cloud, the bride's chamber, the ark of the Lord. Therefore we say, Blessed art thou amongst women who alone hast found a remedy for Eve's sorrow, hast alone wiped away the tears of that mourner, hast carried the price of the world's redemption, hast received the treasure of the pearl in trust. And St. Ambrose, 
Let the virginity and life of the Blessed Mary be drawn before you as in a picture, from whom, as if in a mirror, is reflected the face of chastity and virtue's figure. In learning, the prime stimulus is to be found in the nobleness of the teacher. Now, what is more nobleness than God's mother? Not only praise and veneration were bestowed on Mary by the fathers, they also invoked her intercession. One among several instances is found in the sacramentary of Pope Galatius. We beseech thee, O Almighty God, that the glorious intercession of the blessed and ever-glorious Virgin Mary, Mother of God, may protect us and bring us to eternal life. This was the doctrine and practice of an age which our separated brethren generally regard as an age of pure worship. The Blessed Virgin is honoured as the most highly favoured of God's creatures, but only as such. She is prayed to only as one who can pray for us. This, which is the genuine Catholic doctrine, is taught in all our children's catechisms. If, in Catholic devotions, there occur any expressions that seem to non-Catholics to attribute to Mary anything more than intercessory power, these expressions are very rare, and are never intended to mean more than that she obtains from God everything she asks. Catholics do not ordinarily pray as though they were conscious of the presence of hostile critics, but they have no doubt about the meaning of their own words. Some of our popular treatises on the Blessed Virgin are no less unpalatable to Protestant tastes, and naturally so, for Protestants do not realise, as Catholics do, the unspeakable dignity of one who was made the mother of the Word incarnate. Nor do they appreciate, as Catholics do, what it is to have so great a friend at court as the mother of the glorified Jesus. Though at the same time it should be borne in mind that in all devotions, apart from the direct worship of God, even Catholics have their personal tastes. While they all agree that God's saints should be honoured, they have their personal attractions and repugnances as regards particular ways of honouring them and praying to them. Objection. Devotion to the Blessed Virgin may be reasonable enough when practised in moderation, but in Catholic practice it obtrudes itself everywhere. The more devotion to Mary, the less devotion to her son. Answer. Again, our objector sees the stained glass windows from the wrong side. He may have dropped into a Catholic church in the evening and heard the sodality singing the Litany of the Blessed Virgin or the preacher descanting on one of her virtues, a most Christian act. But let him get up in the morning earlier than usual and betake himself to the nearest parish church any day in the week. There he will find a number of silent worshippers absorbed in something that is taking place at the altar. At the ringing of a little bell, the silence is solemn and all heads are bowed in adoration. Some minutes later, a number of persons approach the altar rail to receive the bread of heaven. Here is the central act of Catholic worship, in comparison with which all things else are insignificant. Or rather, it is through this that all things else have any value. The weekday scene just described is repeated on Sunday, only with more solemnity. On that day, the churches are thronged and are filled again and again in successive hours, whilst the churches of other denominations are often half empty. Evidently, devotion to the Blessed Virgin does not draw us away from Christ. Strange that the very church that is accused of worshipping the creature instead of the Creator should be distinguished among all churches for its adherence to the central doctrine of Christianity, the divinity of Christ. In an age when Protestantism is losing its grasp of that truth, if not in its formularies, at least in the sincere belief of many Protestants, including ministers, the Catholic Church not only believes it and teaches it with uncompromising fidelity, but gives the most solemn expression to its belief in its public worship. What can compare with the external splendour or the intensity of personal devotion associated with the great feasts commemorating the mysteries of our Lord's life, his birth, his passion, 
his resurrection. Holy Week has a meaning in the Catholic Church. It has little or no meaning elsewhere. Evidently, again, devotion to the Blessed Virgin does not draw us away from Christ. But its effect in this regard is not merely negative, it positively draws us nearer to Christ. The feasts of the Blessed Virgin mark a general increase of fervour. The faithful are present at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and very many receive communion after confessing their sins with humble and sincere contrition. Innumerable converts to the Church, who now see the Church from within, know from experience that true and sincere worship of God is promoted by devotion to the Mother of the Incarnate Son of God. End of section 10